live on YouTube, going live on Facebook. Awesome. And any minute now, Facebook, come on. <laughs> Get with the program. Same with you, YouTube. You can do it. I know you can. All right. And we are live, at least over on YouTube. Uh, good evening. Good Friday evening to you folks. Thanks for coming out and hanging around and listening to a live stream. I'm your handsome, hairy host, Bill Silvey, the Dungeon Delver. And tonight on this very special stream, I have the one, the only, Yang Yan Zhao. Uh, hey, everyone. <laughs> who is uh going to we're gonna we're gonna have a wonderful talk all about religion in your D, D games um so before we get started though i just wanted to mention something um when i was talking about lost caverns of sojkant which actually kind of ties in a little bit it kind of ties in a, a little bit specifically with like Greyhawk religions and so on and etc. Mm -hmm. um, I got so caught up in talking about the specific details of that module today, I did not <laughs> give credit where credit was due. Um, my buddy Alan Grohe has an absolutely fantastic page of lore all about uh, Lost Caverns of Sojkonth, its origins, its place in Greyhawk. I'm going to pull that up here real quick. I, I only have about 62 million tabs open in my web browser, so let's see. I've got about that in several windows. Yeah, I need to add a new stick of browser. It's like, oh, you mean memory? No, it's just another four gigs just for my browser. <laughs> Let me see if I can find this real quick. Where is it? Here we go. So for all of you who listened today and are interested, I don't know why Facebook isn't starting. I apologize if you're trying to if you're trying to listen over on Facebook. I don't know what's going on. I will reload it and hopefully it will start. There we are. Okay. That's going. So if you followed that today, and you want some real good meat and potatoes on uh, Lost Caverns of Sochkonth, please avail yourself. Go check out Alan Grohe's uh, extensive write-ups of it. So, Yang, I saw your video because I'm subscribed to you. And, uh, oh, that's something else I'm going to link. Everybody should check out Yang's uh, most excellent YouTube channel. Sorry, again, it's the tabs. Um, Storytime no with Yang Yan Zhao. He has got great interviews. He talks about tabletop gaming and all sorts of stuff over there. And oh, thank you. You, you should go and subscribe to his channel right now. Do it. We'll wait. You back yet? Okay, let's go. Um, <laughs> anyway, so... I watched your most recent video. I guess it's number three in a series, and it was really, uh, it was really resonant with me. Oh, um, right. And particularly because you leaned on on something in it, and I don't want to leave uh, our listeners guessing about what I'm what I'm talking about um, too much. But I think they call it, it. Bear, bearing the lead, but. You talked a lot about making religion non-sucky in D&D by virtue of exploring rituals and so on, investitures, baptisms, mm -hmm. um, rites and rituals in different churches uh, in the real world. Yes. And incorporating them into your D&D game. And... Uh, you know, at the, at the risk of, of seeming a little too simplistic about it, he's right, guys. Do what, do what Yang says with your game. And what, what I have done is, generally speaking, no fantasy games tend to be monotheistic. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, fantasy games draw have well, you know, from fantasy. Um, there's pantheons of gods. There's good gods. There's bad gods. There's there's all sorts of critters and creatures out there. Um, and one of the uh, one of the aspects that I like to 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 draw on though is the idea that you may have a religion that is even though they're aware of other gods they might not like it and they might they be, might not be tolerant of it mm -hmm. um i touched on this when i talked about the theocracy of the pale which is it's a kingdom in greyhawk and it's just what it says on the tin it is a theocracy and while they are good and good aligned i mean you know you got to go back to the old uh the well not terribly old but the the meme you know lawful good does not equal lawful nice yes exactly and they are not a religiously tolerant sort over there in the theocracy of the pale so when i introduced that kingdom to some players a few years ago their first brush with a an evil dragon killing and orc fighting off and standing opposed to the machinations of IU's kingdom was, hey, we're going to round up all the druids and hang them or burn them. You want to come with? <laughs> you know, and, and yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's 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 a bit of a it's a bit of a shock to a party when you you kind of hit them with uh, with with a, a real world. Um, with 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 a real world religious conundrum like that, and it, it needn't necessarily be awful all the time. I mean, right? You know, grim dark in a fantasy setting, uh, when it comes to religion, can be fun. But like warhammer fantasy role play i think is a is a good example of uh, of how you can go over the top with grimdark in a fantasy setting because man just a bit yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean if the av it, it, it's worse in 40k because you know in the grim darkness of the grim future there's only grim war um but uh yeah, you go around talking about, yeah, I saw some heroes. They were fighting chaos creatures. Well, that's heresy. You're gonna you're you're gonna go to the gibbet. Chaos doesn't exist. And uh, you know, if you're acknowledging that it does exist, you must be uh you must be some kind of a cultist, so we'll we'll just do away with you. Um Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, there's such a wide range, and even if you look into our world, within a single religion, there's all often so many different sects you know and every sect believes no we're the true one we're the real one so there's all sorts of great room for conflict it doesn't have to be fighting but you know one group rubs the other the wrong way and it's perfect for you know drama oh yeah oh yeah and it, it, there, there's an element and i it's not terribly original but i do kind of like what i put into my um into my game for the players to kind of hmm and hum over is they have an immensely powerful formerly evil being that is just trying to eke along describe disguised described disguised as a human there is a paladin of the uh religion of Ouijas in the party there is a high level cleric of the church of Heronius in the party. So there's this, this diametric opposition, not in alignment, but in desires for what the church wants with this, you know, the ultimate convert. Both sides tend to view this as, you know, do I not destroy my enemy whom I make my friend? You know, yep. so, so, so both churches have a vested interest in gosh wouldn't it be super cool if she decided to be baptized as a follower of heronius wouldn't it be great if she entered the circle coven of the church of we 
neither side is evil mm -hmm. and how right or not either side is, I leave up to the players to, to try and sort out for themselves. So that's a, that, you know, that's something you can throw at, at a party. Um, Definitely. And and don't be afraid to throw church bureaucracy at players. Is that something you've done, Yang? Have you have you ever uh, broken out the old uh, the old church bureaucracy to to sick on uh, on on players? Um, I have before in one shots. I'm currently working on a campaign guide, and my campaign guide is a little different. Uh, so if we could sit back just for a second, let sure. me let me say what I think. Um, where D and D does religion very well, okay. and that's where you have um, sort of bipolar worlds, where you have like an ultimate good and an ultimate evil, and it could be you know like there's several gods that occupy that ultimate good and several that occupy the ultimate evil, but it's very one or the other. Technically, there's a neutral, but I think the only person I've ever seen use neutral well is actually Gary Gygax. Um, specifically in his Gore the Rogue series. Like it, oh, okay, this makes sense. Uh, whereas normally they just end up being wishy-washy. Um, so it's good there, but for me, where it starts to fall apart is uh, where you get pantheons. So, you know, if you look in our world, like in the Greek pantheon, who's good and who's evil? You know, most people would say Zeus is good, um, but... He was out, you know, transforming women into animals so he could have sex with them. Uh, and most people would say the Lord of Hell, Hades, is bad. But he's the only one who had a really good relationship with his wife. The two of them loved each other. They weren't cheating on each other. So who's good, who's bad? And then you have competing interests. Um, so when it's sort of like a medieval fantasy setting, we, we tend to think more of, like, how Europe was in the Middle Ages. Uh, so it's, you know, good slash bad. But if you go back further, you know, if you think of, well, the Greeks again, um, every city was dedicated to someone, right? right? Like Athens was dedicated to Athena, but you could still worship all these other gods. But it was dedicated to someone. So um, it's a lot, you need to go in more and figure out like, okay, well, what does this God want? What does this religion want? Um, and then from there, you can sort of figure out how does one God either work with another God or how do they oppose another God? And then you have the other question of, are the people following this God actually doing it correctly? Or at some point has it gotten corrupted and they're just following their own wishes, you know, in the name of this God. Um, so, you know, that's where I think D and D does religion well. And then where I sort of see it falling apart. Um, so in one shots, I, I do try to, um, bring things like that in where, um, sort of how you were saying it's, it's, you know, you'll have two religions that, they're not necessarily enemies, but maybe they have opposing goals. You know, mm -hmm. like, even simpler, uh, if you have, uh, let's say, druids who worship forest spirits and stuff, and then you have some other god that, you know, wants the forest cleared for some reason, even though they're both kind of good, and they're both out to promote people's help, like, how do you deal with that conflict? Uh, so I think it's good. It's not as great in a one shot because you usually have a lot of other things to do. Yeah. Um, but for a campaign, it's fantastic. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, generally speaking, your one shots. I mean, you don't have a lot of time to do a lot of world building. If it's if you're right. going to even bother setting it in a campaign, it's going to be something that people know. But if it's if you're like, yeah, I'm going to go to free RPG day and I'm going to run s something set in, you know, my own world is called an Aquila and it's got mm -hmm. all this lore behind it. Leave those notes at home. <laughs> right. Leave those notes at home because you've got three hours and a bunch of people that, you know, they want to go play 
it, just as quick as they're done at your table, they want to go play Pathfinder, or they want to go play something, or they want to go buy dice or something. Just get them involved in your game. If a little bit of a hook of your campaign world, if it's religion, is necessary to the plot, absolutely. You know, don't leave them go, wait, why are we doing this again? Why do we care? Why are we bothering with this? Um, but But to be sure... For a long, drawn-out campaign, I think religion, and I think your particular take on the importance of properly building a religion in your game is is absolutely key. I mean, make up holidays. Make up, yep. you know, significant holy days during the week. There's one day uh, on the Greyhawk weekly calendar, which would be technically our Wednesday that's called God's Day. That's their Sunday. You know, that that's when most people yep. go to church. But what about, you know, what, what about, uh, again, Druids? Do they even have a day, or is it just when they can get out to the woods and sit under a waterfall or, you know, stand next to a stone circle? Um, Definitely. But those are all things you should really build out. And I i don't say this to rub it in the face because, haha, I've got one and nobody else does. Because you should absolutely <laughs> go out and get even an expurgated copy of Deities and Demigods. Now, mm -hmm. this is where I put on my grumpy old man shoes again. And, and Yang, if you want to bust my chops here and say, no, no, other editions did it too, that's fine. You jump right in. But... Deities and Demigods, Jim Ward, Rob Koontz, 1981, has some absolutely invaluable suggestions for player characters, for clerics, and even just for followers. I mean, you know, just because you're a fighter doesn't mean you would have no religious convictions. In fact, if you're the squishy guy standing up front and all that's between you and the Almighty is a thin piece of beaten steel... You know, you don't have prayers. You don't have, you don't have a holy symbol around your neck. You're just hoping that your sword works better than that thing's teeth and claws. You know that that's just a must, I think, for your campaign. Ask your players what god or gods they believe in, and if they yeah. don't, if they don't know, look at their alignment. Give them a salad bar and let them pick one, but get it down from them because that is the beginning of your construction foundation where you can take Yang's excellent advice on looking at real world sources and then back it up with this, with, with the, the guidelines from Ward in deities and demigods. And so, yeah, I mean, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I stepped on. Oh, so, sorry. I was just going to say, you know, I think you're absolutely right. And that book in particular is uh fantastic when you're looking for these kind of things um i maybe it was reprinted later maybe not but i certainly haven't seen it in the current 5e edition which i think is like six years old now um and i'm not sure about ones before but uh the the reason i originally started this series is because i played in other people's campaigns you know, and if I'm a paladin and you're like, oh, well, this is the good God and those guys are evil. And I'm like, well, why do I hate that God? What what makes him evil? You know, it it doesn't seem real to me. So it makes it kind of hard to play the character. Um, but, yeah, I th think you're right. Um, my my intention with the series um, was to get over one other problem. And that's in modern day uh, 2021, at least in the U.S., most people don't go to church anymore so they're not used to um they're really not used to what an average religious life was um at least how it was back when you know gary wrote the original D D. back then most people still went to church and the church um you know all religions and all societies they're they're pretty much always concerned about with the welfare of people and most governments you know, didn't have food programs, they didn't have education programs, they didn't have health programs, but often, um, you know, the churches did, there's been certain um, Islamic uh, republics where uh, the 
um, they would do it there. The Buddhists were always into that. Um, Shinto priests in Japan were were to help that. So a lot of people now, they don't understand just how involved religion was. You know, that's why in a lot of games, for one thing, they'll treat a cleric, you know, the same as you would like a guy who sells shoes. But in societies in those days, they would have at least a position of respect, if not wealth, um, for for being in a religious order. Um, so I think, you know, with, with the videos, and I wish that there were more modern sources on religions in these worlds, because I think people really have a hard time building it into their campaigns. And, you know, I'm trying to break it down into small bits. It's so... Uh, you know, understand what kind of a religious setup you're trying to do and what are the major features, at least in our world. And then uh, with this last one with the rights, you know, everything you can do to make it seem like it's in your world. Like even in our world now, who doesn't do something for Christmas? Even if you're not particularly religious, you're still going to give gifts to people. You still got to send holiday cards and stuff. Um, you know, if you lived in Japan, New Year's Day is the big holiday and it and it was a shinto holiday as well so there you you have to send cards to people for new year's you know so it becomes more than just what's the the specific religious values but it becomes cultural and if you can bring that culture into your campaign then you know it people have much more buy-in no i i agree with you and i feel like um you know, it, it's just uh, it, the last time I was on, um, I was on a uh, stream with Ishi. He talks mm -hmm. about world building, and I think <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I must have, uh, I, I, I must have pushed the wrong button or something because I, I think he had a gamer nerd on talking about world building, and he was talking about literary wor world building, mm -hmm. and there's times when they are very different things. Yes. You know, yes. Um, and I think, you know, when you're writing prose, you tend to start with a broad base and work to a point, your conclusion, your finale, you know, mm -hmm. the denouement of the story. Um, it's the opposite in role-playing games. You start with a tiny yes. bit of detail and then expand out from that. Yes. Yes. Um, as opposed to whittling it down. Like we're taking all these details and we're slowly building down to a point in prose in role-playing games. We're taking a little bit of detail and then we're going to slowly build upward and outward. Um, but, uh, so when you are engaging in world building in role-playing games, particularly if you've got a fantasy setting, a believable religion set and i'm just i'm gonna pause there i'm gonna say it doesn't even necessarily have to be a fantasy setting um dune mm -hmm. do, my god dune is a religious work do, that's true it, not religious work in the sense that hey you should worship uh sandworms and pray to muad'dib but it is a treatise on religion so is stranger in a strange land um they're their worlds are so believable because these religions created are believable. And if you put, I'm not saying that you, the, the dungeon master, and I'm sure Yang's not saying this, you need to go out and be Frank Herbert or Robert A. Heinlein. No, no, not at all. I mean, we have enough heavy lifting stocking dungeons as it is. Um, yes, but it can be so satisfying and so much fun. I had a party way off in the far west of Greyhawk. They unsealed a dungeon and went exploring in it and kept poking the bear, so to speak. And one night, when they got back to the nearby city and settled in and were counting their gold and talking about, okay, who's going to get the Wanda Magic Missiles? Do we want to give the hireling the plus one sword because nobody wants it? Do we want to sell it? Half the city catches on fire. And monsters storm in through the walls, and it's just this glorious disaster. And 
major non-player characters that they I had put personalities into that they liked were getting killed left, right, and center, and so on, and everybody's freaking out. And when the dust finally settles the next morning and they've beaten off the bad guys, the, um, sorry, are we still doing phrasing? They fought the bad guys off, and a couple of weeks later, here comes this caravan into town, and they're draped with one of the characters, one of the party members, holy symbols everywhere. It was the basically the equivalent of a papal mission showing up in this town. And, or a small city, really. And I, I, I pulled out, to, to reference Dune again, I pulled out the classic uh, line that the Emperor gave the Baron in the final act of Dune in the film, you know. He summoned them in and looks at the paladin and says, why did you summon me here? And both the players and the characters were just kind of, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry, there must be some confusion. We didn't. And he kind of pauses, thinks about this, stops in his meal that he's eating at the time. I always figure having the bad guy sitting there so relaxed that they're just eating a meal when they're talking to the characters, or not even a bad guy, just a temporary adversary, is like the ultimate in cool, right? Um... And he says, oh, but you did. You did because your actions necessitated my presence here. And I mean, the temperature at the table must have dropped 10 degrees. You could have heard a pin drop in the room at that point. <laughs> because they were like, we done fucked up. Because they were breaking seals and interdictions on this dungeon that were put there for a reason. Yep. And that's the kind, and I literally had no other idea than describing this character who looks like um, a, a latter year Max von Sydow coming in and reading him the riot act. But seeing how, quite frankly, scared they were of what he said and how he said it, I just took off. And from that day forward, I started building the, Church of Heronius in my world of Greyhawk campaign. You know, they're a very yep. stern, unforgiving religion. And you do that. You, it, you don't have to. Again, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to say, oh, crap. Definitely. Well, let me go get a Torah. Let me go get a few treaties on the history of the Catholic Church. Let me, <laughs> you know, get a new King's J King James uh, Bible and and start writing. You can take your best ideas and build on them. Just build a consistent internal framework. Look at deities yes. and demigods. Listen to Yang's podcast about it. And do yourself a favor because most games, and I said not even necessarily fantasy games, and I'm going to get back to that in just a second, but most fantasy games are based in a pseudo northern European medieval setting, and the church is the center of that universe. Mm -hmm. That's true. It, it it really is. Now, I said not even necessarily in a fantasy setting. Um, have you ever played any Twilight Two Thousand Yang? I have not. It is a it is a very very good. It is a very nuts and boltsy uh, post apocalypse game set in the kind of waning shots of World War III. The nukes have flown, the expensive guided munitions have all been fired off. Gasoline or, you know, jet fuel is virtually non-existent. So you've still got Soviets and Americans fighting each other, but it's kind of like Powers Booth said in, uh, in um, Red Dawn, you know, tomorrow it could be, it could be Spears. That's mm -hmm. that's really the, the, the situation. But one of the modules is called the Black Madonna. Now, if you're not up on your Polish religious history, and why wouldn't you be? Um, uh, the Black Madonna is an adventure module for Twilight 2000. But the people of the countryside in Central Europe, you know, they've, you know, stood out on their on their rooftops and in fields at night watching the great cities of the world flare and burn 
So mm-hmm. what, you know, what do you do now? You know, the guy with an M16 and a full magazine is pretty much the, the lord of the manor, right? Exactly. Um, so it goes back to exactly the way it was before, religion. And in the Black Madonna, securing the the faith of the people involves, in Twilight 2000, basically going on a dungeon adventure to acquire an icon of the Virgin Mary. And it's a real, it's actually a real religious artifact called the black madonna oh, and okay the russians want to stop you from getting it what's left of the russian troops the americans who want to try and rebuild some kind of stable government and what's left of poland and it be allied with what's left of nato want the black madonna so basically you have an adventure module set in modern well post-apocalyptic times that is very heavily steeped in uh, Catholic symbology and Catholic iconography. Mm -hmm. And and it's a brilliant piece of writing on behalf of, I want to say Mark Miller wrote the adventure. I could be completely wrong about that. If you have played Twilight 2000 or if you've got a copy on your shelf and you want to chime in and, and put something in one of the chats and say, oh, no, it wasn't Mark Miller. It was this person. Please feel free. And passerby, I saw your comment. I'm, uh, we'll we'll address that in just a minute. But um, that's just an example of just because you're not running a fantasy game, it doesn't mean that religion is not going to have any play, and that you shouldn't work on that. You know, um, right? I mean, it, and you just have to look back at human history. Religion has been one of the most important motivators, um, as well as like acquiring land and um you know access to resources those three are probably the the biggest motivators that people have had religion you know plays a huge huge uh part in um everywhere in the world it's really just in the last 50 years or so that we see it downplayed a lot in our own culture but that doesn't mean it's going to stay that way so a lot of these worlds they feel a little they they feel to me they feel a little bit like you go to a strip mall, you know, like there's a Starbucks, there's a McDonald's, and everything's the same. But it's when you go somewhere new and you see like oh well they do this differently here and they have their own version of this, so it's um, it's the flavor that really adds to the world. And then once you sort of have that as a guideline, it's much easier to make. Um, I think to make NPCs, to make, you know, conversations seem more natural and realistic because you have somewhere to go. You don't have to make everything up from whole cloth. Exactly. So exactly. So now, um, and hello, Chris Kane. I see you over there. Greetings. Um, just a passerby makes a couple of uh, pointed, but I think actually very uh, on-point comments over on YouTube. Uh, be consistent. Religions in most holy books are far from consistent. That's true. And mm-hmm. that's where we as game masters get the, the big do-over oopsie button. But wait, you said this, per, you know, you said this God never had paladins. And you said we just found, you know, this tablet that talks about this paladin. Well... I guess you covered up some apocrypha, didn't you? Or uncovered some apocrypha. And I'm not saying yeah. you you only have to do that with with mistakes that you make, but that's part of that religion which leads to world building, you know? You keep that in your back pocket. The the players are like there've never been paladins of of uh the god Bob. God Bob has never had paladins ever. We go into a dungeon one day and we find this elaborate Rosetta Stone-like affair that talks about the paladins of God Bob. Wait a minute. Do we take this back to the high priest of Bob and say, hey, guess what we found? Or will we get burned at the stake as heretics for that? Is this a heresy? Is it real? Should we cast commune and ask Bob ourselves? You can do a lot for building your religions by focusing on the inconsistency of real world envisions. Um, 
And uh, I think a passerby follows it up. So you know it's a fantasy when religion is consistent. Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, yeah I, I think in um, when you're creating worlds, um, it's good to have a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say a Bible, but like a, a locked in stone set of guidelines for your religion that doesn't change for you. Uh, but they should be very broad. So, for example, uh, I think in the second video, I actually went over uh, the Nicene Creed, uh, which is a Catholic prayer, and it's everything yes. you need to know about Catholicism in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. It's several lines, and it spells out exactly what they believe, why they believe it, and what the purpose is. And that's it. And everything else in Catholicism is, I don't want to say it's fluff, but, you know, it's all add-ons, and it's all, like, a little bit from culture A, a little bit from culture B. But as long as you have that core, um, it's, it's Catholicism. But as long as you have that, which you don't actually have to give to players, it gives you enough to build off of it. And, uh, yeah, exactly what you were saying. The inconsistencies, the apocrypha, um, and even just, you know, group A, uh, you know, look at the difference between, like, Catholics and Protestants. It's really pretty much the same thing, but some very important differences on how people believe you should act based on that original, uh, the original idea. So it makes a fantastic world. You know, you can have religion A, but you can have cult one, cult two. Uh, you got some weird people who don't agree with everyone, so they're off in a desert in their own monastery. Mm -hmm. It's just very fertile territory. Yeah, yeah. And something else you should keep in mind, because not you, I, I think you're well aware of this, Yang, but you listeners, is um, time and distance in a world where travel is not easy for the common mm -hmm. man should absolutely impact and shape how your religions and thus your societies grow. Look at, I mean, you know, the distance of a few hundred miles in Europe and in, in, in uh, the Middle East, the Middle East, mm -hmm. vastly changed and shaped how people believed about certain things. Um, you know, you had a whole sects dead set against each other just based on the simplest little things that if you're like look if you guys lived 150 miles closer to each other you know our 20th century sensibilities say if you guys just lived 150 miles closer to each other you'd realize that you're both actually correctly living by abrahamic law and that's when the bread loaf size stones start slamming into you um from both sides yep but um to, to kind of take that over to what Ricky is asking there in the chat. Thoughts on environment making deities relevant, such as in Mesopotamia? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, if you've ever read Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, and if you've never read Snow Crash by Neil Stevenson, do yourself a favor and go do it. Um, part of the plot of Snow Crash involves the history of the invention of languages and they go a little bit into understanding how language was spread and how uh worship of sumerian gods got going and how the environment of mesopotamia shaped their religious understanding um and this is stuff that after the fact, I didn't just assume that Neil Stevenson was a uh, religious and historical genius and go with it. But after the fact, looking it up, I'm like, this boy did his homework. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, he, he talks about, you know, the, the, the different myths and, the uh, you know, the, the um, uh, what is it, is it the, the sperm of Enki fertilizing the land. Well, I mean, that, you know, I'm not trying to be gross, but, the you know, the, the waters of, of the rivers were pretty sticky, nasty messes. But when they would flood and, the you know, the floods would recede, well, what did they do? They deposited much needed nutrients into the soil. So you'd have yep. great crops on floodplains. 
And that, that was their level of understanding. So they're like, oh, this is the ejaculate of God, and it's, it's, making, it's making our crops grow. So you can absolutely go with an environment that affects the religious belief of players. You know, uh, look at um, the, the frankly beautiful Polynesian system of beliefs and, and uh, how they, they worshipped uh, the spirits of the earth and the sea. You know, you're on a mm-hmm. tiny little island in the middle of essentially the universe. You know, you don't even think about areas more vast than maybe a day's travel across at its widest point, right? Uh-huh. So your universe is sea and it's rock that spews molten rock. So that tends to seriously affect your your religions. And I mean that I, I will I will throw down that gauntlet. I will throw down that challenge to anyone listening to this. Put a Polynesian type culture in your game. Mm-hmm. And think about it. Even if you only do it as a thought experiment and your players are never going to go there. Think about how a mind, a pre-enlightenment mind, not dumber, not not less intelligent mind, just a pre-enlightenment mind, would perceive these natural events. Hurricanes that could literally scour everything down to the level of grass. Mountains, oh, yeah. you know, high, you know, pieces of solid stone rock that could split in half and bleed blood red goo out that would burn you alive if you even touched it with with one hand like you know your whole body would catch um think about how those people and their religions would or how their worldview would be shaped and how they would try and comprehend that and rationalize that so absolutely and Yang, I think I think you and I are on the same sheet of paper. That is going to impact those religions. So when you're looking sure. at your campaign world and your religions, look at where they are, not just why they are. Uh, yeah, and the other thing too is if you look at how the development of history generally goes in our world, um, what you start out with is you start out with smaller tribes and people who worship um like a form of animism so animism is the worship of nature spirits and uh ancestors but another thing they worship a lot are animals especially the animals that will kill you so when we look at um uh you know early cultures they might worship lions there might be like a, a chimpanzee god or a gorilla god or something like that and then as societies evolve, you start to get um, anthropomorphic gods. So like the Egyptians, they had gods with people bodies, but they still had the head of animals. You know, the Egyptians were still getting killed by crocs and hippos and everything. So they still had a place, but they started to see themselves more as gods. And once you get to a point of like ancient Greek, ancient Rome, most of the gods are human shape. They're like us, but just awesomer. Um, and so you can, uh, based on the environment, like is your the area you are, are there a lot of wild animals? Is, is it a dangerous place to live? Or is it more like Bilbo in the Shire where, you know, the worst thing was some kid stealing your fruit or something? Um, and so that can also help in how you create the gods. And people always worship a god because they want something, right? So, um, you know, like if you're in Mesopotamia, you want to make sure that the rains come on time every year. So you might pray for rain uh, for some god that prays for rain and makes sticky rivers. Um, If you're in the ocean, in that Polynesian island... You know, some god that will make the sailing smooth and calm the seas is very important to you. So there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, to build on what you're saying, if you know the sort of the geography, like where this place is physically, it can really give you some quick ways to decide what kind of gods you have. Yes, 
Yes, without a doubt. And that ties in to what the gods expect of you. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you you know, uh, I'm I'm not going to go into the specifics of it just because it's rather gruesome. But uh, in deities and demigods, Jim, who did do his homework very well, I mean, it's it's a very good book to read. I I wouldn't try and use it as a source for you know your anthro one hundred and one class when you go to college, but <laughs> just the same, um, it's it's a good read. Uh, Jim talks a lot about uh, the uh, Central American religions are kind of loosely packed together uh in a section of the book and in the back of the book and this is something you should also look at when you think about how your players are worshiping a god but it gets to like uh, um the rain god uh which would be very important for a number of reasons even in a wet jungly region like uh Mm -hmm. like central america or some places some places in central america uh and i know i'm going to mutilate this i'm sorry i am obviously not a a native speaker uh tleok tleok but tleok rain god oh okay he's a god of rain so you know maybe what what would his sacrifice be uh pottery uh you know wooden uh wooden implement drums for rain no babies <laughs> and, and and how that's done is pretty damn horrifying, actually. And it's you know, if any of my players ever come to me and say, "Hey, Bill, could we run a game set in Central, uh, you know, Central American mythos?" Uh, yes and no, <laughs> yes and no. But um, the uh, you know, that's that's looking at something that is so important to that region of the world having that rain Mm -hmm. that they'll engage in rather horrible things to make sure that everything is copacetic and that that rain comes at the right time absolutely and the people there will start making uh festivals and they'll start having fun at these sacrifices it'll be like a big social events as well yeah yeah exactly i mean imagine you know, th- think about small town America, and and I hate to make this comparison. Good Lord, please don't smite me for this. Um, <laughs> you know, think about you know a town of a couple thousand people. How pretty it looks at Christmas and everything. Now imagine mm-hmm. the culmination on Christmas Eve is like a massive human sacrifice. That's you're like that's completely insane. Well, that was that was their jam. Yeah. <laughs> you know, making sure the rains come because shit's going to be bad if it doesn't. Yeah, in my current campaign, I have uh, a society, hopefully my players will get too soon, that's like a mashup of Mayan, Aztec, plus Egyptian, plus Ottoman Turk. And that's one of the things about them is they make blood sacrifices. You need to have the blood. And um, they do. So the thing is, you know, they don't want to sacrifice themselves. They don't want to sacrifice their kids. So um, slavery is technically legal, and what will happen is people will sell themselves into slavery to become the sacrifice for some family, um, and then you know the, that money will be given to their kids or to their, to their wife or whatever. So if you were an older guy who you knew your health wasn't good and there wasn't that much time left, you might choose to sacrifice yourself. So in doing this, uh, you you help yourself by getting money for your family, and these rich families would have their blood sacrifices. So there's there's all sorts of ways that you can work this in, and it sort of complicates the issue because normally we would say, well, blood sacrifice bad, but a guy providing for his family, like I kind of can't fault him. Uh, so it it's good to sort of, in my opinion, to sort of muddy the waters a little bit. Like, the less absolute good and the less absolute bad you have, uh, the better. Because then it makes players make their own moral choices. And uh, I find that players engage more when they do. And they really think about the game that they're playing more when they have to make those sort of choices. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think you can... I'm going to disagree with you. No, I, I'm not going to disagree with with the the depth and that. I think you can make a mess of thing with the, things with the wrong group and moral ambiguity. Yes, yes, that's definitely true. Um, I'm not one of those people who engages in the whole, and I, I I'm very adamant about this. Of you know. Ha ha, I'm going to send the paladin to a kingdom where slavery is legal and, and, you know, slavery is evil, but it's legal here, but you're lawful good. So what do you do, paladin boy? Anything you do, you'll <laughs> fall. Ha ha ha. Um, you know, there's an ethos that rises above that, I, I, sure. I feel like. Um, it, but, and I want to put a big caveat on that. If your players know what they're getting... If your players know what they're they're in for, absolutely, and that's something. Don't. Um, I talked about being consistent, and passerby was said, you know, if the religion is consistent, it, you know, it's made up. Um, well, yes, it's made. Of course, all of this is made up. <laughs> um, but players will tire. If when you're crafting your religion, you've got to remember players will tire of gotchas. Yes. Um, you know, if you spend three years telling them that, you know, God's day is the time to bring a dove down to the temple and and uh, you know, set it free, and then you know, everybody's ninth level and you say, ha ha, you're all fifth level because you've been cursed by the gods because you didn't read this apocryphal scroll that I had hidden <laughs> in the statue in the dungeon that you guys never went to that said that that actually displeases the gods. And, you know, that's that's what what we call in professional dungeon mastering a dick move. And, yes. you know, so when I say be consistent, mm -hmm. And I know there's going to be people that said, yeah, but there's stuff in the Bible that's 10 times worse. I'm not here to have a discussion about real world religion. I'm talking about <laughs> making your religions work in the constraints of a D&D &D game or, or any role playing game. Um, you know, do not do things like that to your players, regardless of what it is. I don't care if it doesn't have anything to do, do with religion. You know, it's like. Oh, our characters are getting ready to retire now and everything's wonderful. And hey, do you guys remember back in Keep on the Borderlands when uh, you uh, threw your mug of uh, beer into the face of that merchant? Yeah. Well, it turns out he was a powerful magic user and he wishes you all to be cockroaches. What? 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 Wait, you're talking about like five, six, seven years ago. Why are, why are you screwing us like this? That's going to be a group of people that don't want to game with you anymore. Um. So regardless yeah. of how you're doing it, if your players accept that your world is less Lord of the Rings and more Game of Thrones, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But if you set them up for Lord of the Rings, don't Game of Thrones them uh, in, in the last two minutes, you know? It's just... Yeah, I, I definitely agree. It definitely does depend on your group. Um, th this group is playtesting my campaign, and I know them well. And uh, it's it's actually kind of interesting because three of them are kind of playing an evil campaign and the other three are playing a good campaign. Um, so we're going to see how much of a train wreck this creates. Um, it's great when you're testing because pretty much everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So it gives you a good idea how to fix things. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, you need to, to sort of, uh, you know, take the temperature in the room before you make hard decisions. I mean, the, the, um, for example, in the campaign guide, I, I'm sort of like writing notes, like, eh, if you're, if your group's a little more like this, you might want to leave this part out. And I would definitely have the slavery part left out, um, of that if, you know, your, your players aren't so into it. Um, but, Luckily, for the most part, this religion is sort of newly introduced, so there's not really any pulling the rug out from under people at this point. But, yeah, if I had told them that, like, oh, these guys are great, uh, 
like you were saying, for three years. And then all of a sudden they realize they've been doing evil things all this time. Um, it's It would not go well. Yeah, that... that um for the longest time back and this doesn't have anything to do with the religion this is just a sort of a broader statement and to be clear on something i was not when i when i say you i am not mm -hmm. i'm not referring to you to me specifically oh yeah, yeah specifically yeah, yeah. this is just good dming advice which i think you absolutely understand but we used to play um uh battletech or mech warrior the role-playing game back in the uh, late 1980s ooh. early 1990s and every one of us, when we would helm the game, thought we were the cleverest dicks in the world because we would introduce a betrayal scenario. Mm. You know? Oh, you're not getting a new battle mech. You're being arrested for treason. Dun, dun, dun. Bet you guys didn't see that coming. Yeah, we sure didn't because that's not what happened in the last five campaigns. Um, <laughs> it, just, it, it just got ridiculous to where, you know we were trying to out grimdark each other in the 31st century. It's like, oh yeah, but lives are cheap and battle mix are expensive. And, but yeah, we're also here to have fun. You know, it's, it's, yeah. we're not asking for brand new factory minted Atlas hundred ton war machines here. We just, you know, don't want to work for a guy who says he's going to pay us with new uh, Myomer actuators and we find out it's just boxes of pasta. You know, when yeah. when, when when we open the uh, the spare parts shipment that that's it's getting a little old. Um and the the, yeah. the warning there is that yes, it, it it constantly pulling the rug out from under your players whether it's it just in day-to-day -day dealings or in a religion by setting them up in, in constant no-win situations is tiresome so if you're going to have those gotchas at least give your players a chance to have looked in the bible torah scrolls tablets chicken guts however the word of the deity is carried across to you to them right yeah there. i i totally agree with you and, it, and it's funny i was just thinking about something today um you you sort of have to deal with players previous scarring um in their previous campaigns in in the campaign i'm running um every time my players come onto a door like it'll take them 15 minutes trying to decide how to open it and like they'll buff up and you know they'll like people be hanging out behind like columns and boulders and whatnot i have never once trapped a door in this campaign <laughs> so this is all just stuff they bring themselves well it's time to uh, start doing that i think <laughs> it's coming it's coming um but uh yeah i think so uh you know if you are going to have that kind of betrayal or whatnot it should be set up beforehand so for example you know a good way to do it with religion is you have people whether they're player characters or npcs who worship different gods or at least are from different sects of one religion and so they can be your friend and they can help you out as long as your goals and the goals either of that god or that religion are are in parallel but once you start to deviate from that you know that's where the the problem is going to come and it can be uh let's say yeah like let's say you have that lawful good paladin npc and you're starting to get into a little sketchier territory, a little more Machiavellian territory. He can he can flip on you like that. And it's not necessarily pulling the rug out of someone. It's more like, well, you should have seen the signs and you knew what the guy was about. So as long as you're consistent on that front, you know, the game can take all sorts of twists and turns as to who who's your ally, who's your not who's not your ally. Um, and it can still be fun, but yeah, it, you can't just have someone flip on a dime without players feeling a bit betrayed. Yes, yes, without a doubt. There, there, there's. Um, I, I, I tease a, a friend of mine, and I know the the reasons of why he did this, but in between games, so we had this apartment. This is back thirty. This is back many years ago. 
Um, mm -hmm. And there were three roommates, all of them gamed. We were all gamers. And the, there were eight or ten of us over there on any given night of the week playing some kind of role-playing game. And Jeff ran really good uh, Hero Systems, uh, which uh, champions its uh, superhero system. Um, he ran really good hero system games and he would eavesdrop on what we were saying about what we thought the twists and turns of the plot would be. <laughs> and it's not so much that he acted on that. It's that we would talk about what we would do in certain scenarios. If the certain out of not in character i don't not at the table like we're all loaded in the car on our way to see you know ghostbusters 2 or or alien 3 or you know whatever and just just kind of motoring along taking mental notes so that when we did get back to the game table it turns out dr destroyer knew of our plans all along well i mean come on <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah and i i rib jeff about that ceaselessly he plays in my monday night game and i will like you know something will be going on and i'll say yeah yeah no guys don't don't worry about that because i mean what kind of a monster would i be as a dungeon master if i took what you guys said out of character and out of game and then adjusted the game so that your out of character shared ideas would be foiled in my game and just you know, that's the worst DM in the world. And it <laughs> yeah. usually gets a chuckle out of Jeff. But at the time, it wasn't funny. It was annoying. I only do that when their ideas are better than mine. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. I, I, I think it, regardless of the situation, it goes without saying that if your players come up with good ideas, and that includes your religions too. Mm -hmm. I, I have had players in my games where I, you know, I, I wasn't, you like Athena, you know, I burst forth from my father's forehead in full DM armor. Um, you know, I used to very hand wave religions too, uh, until or unless somebody wanted to cast commune or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a spell that produces 10 to a hundred hippie, hippie followers who just want to live <laughs> in peace, man. Um, but I remember on a couple of occasions, just sitting back and listening to two players talk in character it's, you know people are getting pizza and sodas we're taking a break people are stretching you know massaging their butts because they've been sitting for a few hours and everything else and two players continuing to interact solely in character and one of them i remember he just rolled with this uh aspects of saint cuthbert religion that i had never like i had never said uh you know hey chris you should do this or here's how the religion works or anything like that and i was just like mentally scribbling down notes as fast as i could because it was friggin brilliant so of all the resources mm -hmm. you can steal from don't be afraid to steal from your players yeah actually i kind of like them um to fill in the details so if you're writing a story and the religion is a major plot point, you should create that yourself. But um, like in my in my world, it's like every town has their own gods. Um, so there's there's just thousands upon thousands. So if someone's like, uh, you know, oh, I want to be a cleric, I'll say, OK, well, um, here's some major religions you can choose from. But if you want your own and if they choose their own. Uh, then I just ask them, you know, I have my list of, you know, rituals. I have uh, like a few basic tenets that I need. And I say, okay, well, what is, what does this God do for you? You know, and I have one person who uh, is comes from off the game map. They lived in an underground cavernous society. And it's like, oh, well, why would you pray to this God? What is, what is this God going to do for you? And, you know, she came up with, oh, well, we want out of here. We want our own city. We want our own, you know, this and that. And it's like, oh, okay. All right. So I take notes and then, you know, I maybe alter things a little bit. Um, but then that's great because I have that God. I, I know um, what 
the people want from the god and then maybe i just need to think of like well what does the god want you know and then you're on from there and that takes most of the heavy lifting off of me yeah it, exactly so do use your do use your players as a mind for fleshing out your religions if they come to you now you've got to be you know you you've you've got to be consistent with your own model i mean to go back to heronius mm -hmm. you know if i had somebody come to me and say hey bill my character worships heronius okay that's awesome um and they said listen i've got this great idea for temple prostitutes to heronius what do you think i'd say uh, that's, <laughs> maybe you need to be worshiping maris or or even barry uh, but not yeah yeah uh, that's you, you know uh Unless you have a very particular kink, Heronius, that's not his jam. Um, but uh, do, yeah, do let your players bring stuff to the table, too. And if it's based in something, they're like, yeah, you know, I went to Catholic school. You know, we do the catechism mm -hmm. and it's and it's like yep. this. What if I change that around? And, you know, instead of, you know, instead of seeing the saint's name, I say Heronius's name or something. If that if that works for you, man, absolutely go for it. Your players can be your best friends when it comes to giving you ideas, um, and reward it. If it's a cool idea, you know that's that's one of the key things. The rule of cool, reward mm -hmm. that reward that good uh, that that good idea on their part. Hey, you don't have to like give them ten thousand XP or you know a million sure. gold pieces or anything, but yeah. Well, I think, too, another kind of reward that's often good is giving them, like, special scenes or um, sort of deviating from the main storyline to give them certain quests. Uh, so, for example, uh, I know it's apocryphal here, but in D&D &D 5e, uh, when, a, when a cleric or a paladin reaches the third level, they sort of pick their subcategory of their class. And that's when they take oaths, or that's when they officially become initiated into the religion. So, um, you know, have them do some special quest, you know, to make it, um, or they have to, like, go acquire some items. Like, maybe the paladin needs to go, I don't know what would be appropriate at level 3, but it needs to go into some area, and uh, without any armor, he needs to... Uh, just his faith in his god kill a stag and bring the heart back or something like that so it makes them more invested in this organization and uh with the god and you can ask the players like well you know what do you think would be a kind of uh an appropriate sort of ceremony or or an appropriate kind of quest and then you know sort of formulated about that so then for sure the player is going to be very happy when they achieve what essentially they they wanted to you know what what they sort of designed yes that is uh that, that's great great advice and uh, one thing i can tell you that that fits in kind of with that a little bit um if you guys want to watch a uh a very good short fantasy film that was semi lost for decades uh check out black angel um it was done by it was direct produced and directed by one of the effects technicians who worked for um who worked for uh lucas on empire strikes back and george lucas he screened it for lucas and lucas said look i want some i want a short film to play before empire in select venues and give me i will help you finish black angel monetarily if you will if we can use it because it's a fantastic movie and it's um it's set in the time of of the black plague ravaging europe and it's about a knight a paladin if you will who essentially faces a moral and ethical choice to uh to to do the right thing and um i strip mind that for ideas for a paladin who went questing for his war horse he was like i want to get you know i want to call my war horse and i'm like you're not just going to whistle and it comes galloping over a hill you know yeah lit up by a god ray and 
walks up to you and expects an apple. You've got to work for this. And Black Angel is a very grim, dark little piece of film. Um, so little inspirations like that. And if you want to know about lawful good religions butting up against realms that are not lawful good, uh, another great source uh, you should absolutely check out is um, Three Hearts and Three Lions by Paul Anderson. It's just a fine damn book even if you don't have any of these uh, issues. Um, but Three Hearts and Three Lions, which uh, deals with the matter of France, which is uh, the medieval story of Christendom fighting against fairy, hmm. which in medieval legends, elves and, and fairies and sprites and so on, because of the way Europe was turning over the course of a thousand years, went from being wise and goodly and kindly forest spirits into servants of the Antichrist. Um, yeah. So that's kind of the bent that they take in the matter of France, and it's reflected in Paul Anderson's Three Hearts and Three Lions. Also, it introduces a lot of tropes and things um, that... Uh, that... Um, are standard in D and D, uh, the ranger regenerating trolls with big rubbery green noses and that sort of thing. Um, paladins, Nixies and a whole bunch of other stuff. Gary lifted whole cloth from the book. Um, so, uh, what did I, say? Uh, a midsummer's tempest, which is set in the 1500s, and deals with, well, okay, the Cavaliers fighting the Roundheads during the um, uh, one of the English Civil Wars of that time period. Well, what if one side or the other had the help of fairies? Mm -hmm. And Shakespeare's The Tempest was a real, was not a made-up play, but an actual, like, factual telling of of uh of events um and then finally uh um the high crusade which is hilarious and it shows that monotheistic medieval religions or medieval religious people were not as stupid as you might have them think because they get the best over a bunch of aliens who show up bent on conquering the earth, but I don't want to spoil it. They're fun <laughs> reads, but they can be really, really great reads as far as understanding, like what, you know, okay. My paladin wants to atone because he, you know, backhanded the barmaid who smarted off to him. And mm -hmm. now I have no paladin abilities. What do I do? Grab one of those books, look through them. Um, they're they're just they're awesome reads so um but if your players bring you an idea odds are they probably got a pretty good idea roll with it you know i am the first person in the world who will dig my heels in and say deity is not cooperative storytelling yes i don't like that oh dnd is a game where you get together and you have cooperative storytelling no 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 um, that's, that's not, that's not my vision of D and D. Um, but if a play, you know, if a player's got a great idea, you want to talk about religion in D and D Yang, did you know that the reason there are clerics in D and D is because a player asked for a counter to, a another character whose player was a vampire in a, in an OD and D campaign? I did not know that. Yes. Um, a character, and I, I think it was in Dave Arneson's campaign, but I could be wrong. It might have been in Gary's Greyhawk campaign. I've heard both. A character got bit by a vampire. The party killed the vampire, and he was like, well, hang on a second. We visit, we, we go in dungeons. What if you guys just carry my coffin into the dungeon and then let me out and I adventure with you guys? And then I can use all my cool vampire powers. And so everybody, eh, all right, that's an idea. 
Well, the vampire was somewhat codified, and so the player running the vampire was like, I want that plus two sword. Well, I'm not going to give it to you. And they'd pass a note to the to the dungeon master. I am using vampire charm ability to make Jim give me the uh, the magic sword. Okay, uh. Jim, you got to give him the mat. And players got tired of this. So uh, having seen the Witchfinder General the with... Um, uh, Oh, not David Prowse. Uh, Chris, not Christopher Lee. Not David Prowse. Um, Cushing with Peter Cushing. Oh. They said, hmm. you know, this Hammer Horror movie called The Witchfighter General. They said, I want to play somebody who can destroy undead. And so they sketched out the cleric. And there we go. There, that, that created, there were two players who both brought ideas and one of them brought religious ideas to the table and the DM said, sure. And it created a f one of the, the foundational stones of d d was created in that moment because the DM listened. And we actually have a question. Uh, Rob Adams says, have you ever ha actually had a player atone or lose spells or abilities for not following the edicts of their gods? I'm going to bounce that over to you, Yang, because I've been running my mouth for 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's just when... It's usually they... Well, it's one of the things I like to do when the party starts turning into murder hobos. <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll give them enough rope to hang themselves with, but then there will be consequences fairly quickly. Um, so that's one of the things. Like, you'll go and uh, try to raise someone from the dead... Like, nope, not going to happen. You go to try to cure some party members in the middle of the fight, you just sort of fizzles out as it as it goes from your hands. And, uh, you know, then the party is all pissed at you, too. So uh, they, sort of, they sort of get with the program real quick. And I've had them do different things. Uh, some took a vow of silence. Uh, so they couldn't talk during the whole... Uh, for several sessions, I've had people who, um, you know, they have to do a special quest or um, especially like I had one guy who was basically stealing stuff and his god got PO'd. So he had to, well, he had to go see a higher level priest, basically. And the priest is like, oh, yeah, you need to donate um, X amount of gold. Not group gold. You personally have to donate. And it was, you know, thousands of gold that took him quite a while to earn. Um, but, you know, he slowly got his powers back. That's that's awesome. That's, that's absolutely awesome. Um, and we have Rob Adams says... Uh, Rob, did you just ask my car like on the fly? Did you do, do you like have like a a red uh, like a presidential line to my car? <laughs> my car, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, was an editor of many things, including the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual. The first of them, um, and of course, one of the members of the Late Geneva Group, uh, and Mike. According to Rob says it may have been originated in Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign where he played Bishop Carr, a vampire fighting clergyman. The cleric published in OD&D was part fighting man and part uh, magic user, uh, September 26, 2014. Um, oh, Rob just looked it up. OK, I don't know if you had like the presidential hotline to, to reach out to him, but um, uh, they should be used. I had a similar situation. The demon that has joined the party. Again, there's a, a mid-high level paladin in the party who made the on-spot judgment to just say, awesome, you're lawful good now. You're not chaotic evil. You're going to join our party and everything is going to be cool. Um, but uh, then the paladin went to use some of her paladin powers and they weren't working. So... I mean, I was I was just doing this on the fly, but it got codified. Now, if you're not up on your Greyhawk lore, Weejoss is a psychopomp. She is a major goddess of death. 
she doesn't want you dead, you know? She's not like, I'll send plagues of zombies and and necromancers are my jam and everything like that. Um, in fact, she hates that sort of thing. Uh, it's just her role. Magic and death, those are her two roles. And she can have lawful, evil, neutral, or good worshippers, which explains the paladin. Um, she herself is lawful, neutral, with evil, uh, lawful, evil tendencies. But... Um, so on the fly, thinking about this, I said, okay, your paladin abilities don't work. You'll have to go see the priestess. Well, I kind of figured that we Joss, rather than having an official clergy, although I did amend that a little bit, would have a coven of witches. Mm -hmm. So going to a temple is basically, you know, you go to Stevie Nicks's house, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, mm -hmm. she, she's burning incense and everything like that, reading tarot cards and, and the character explained what she had done and she the high priestess was like meet me on this hill after the moons have set before dawn tonight and I figured out what the player had to do they and the priestess said, you know, I've communed i've looked at the i've looked at the tarot cards and the whole nine yards you can give up being a paladin you, you know you still worship we joss you don't lose your your um your status or anything like that other than not being a paladin you can kill this demon right now just basically like you leave here go find her if she's asleep or whatever and kill her mm -hmm. or you can walk on the silver path and she pours out a cup of hemlock and hands it to her and says you can do that so the player and and ask we joss yourself what to do so the player drank the hemlock and died and then we role played out the player waking up in Acheron having to explain to Weejoss why she had made the decision on her own without consulting the coven, without consulting the the temple proper. Hey, what do I do if I have a demon that says it's lawful good now? Um, and, you know, Weejoss basically gave her a good scolding and then woke her back up. And it, it worked out really well, other than a single save versus poison, which the character willingly failed. There was no dice rolling. It was just good role playing. But when the car when the player told me, he was like, uh, "Yeah, I want to, you know, I want to read a tarot here before I make up my mind about what to do." I was like, uh, "Fine, I don't have a deck of tarot cards around here, so I just typed in online tarot card, and the first one I got, and it drew up some cards, and I was like, "Holy shit, that actually kind of fits this scenario." So I said, there you go. Um, and it just, it worked out really well for, for the player and I. So that is now how the Jacidian church works. And it just, it just Ooh. kind of happened organically there. So, but it's a case of like, was the question was asked, you know, a character who had done something and they had to atone for it. There was the atonement. Yeah, and two, um, if they don't want to atone it, you know, sometimes uh, players sort of go off the rails with uh, paladins and clerics because they're just not really jiving with that player type. I did have a player once, they lost their powers, and they were like, uh, you know, I'd really like to, you know, they liked the character itself, but they really wanted to play another class. So for me, that was a good point. Like, okay, this god has cut its connection to you and then i think they wanted to be like uh a druid or something so you know i just as for fun and normally i don't like to you know let people start that high level but good group so so okay uh you know you can switch over to like a more ambiguous uh kind of uh training and so we just had like an um like an in-game 
everybody just kind of rested for like a few months and then you know they were able we said that they were training with druids at that point so it's also you know if people aren't all that happy with um the way their their character class is going that's a pretty good chance for them to jump into something else sure yeah the the unrepentant uh priest trope is is definitely one that if your players want to pursue that uh, you know there's there's plenty of of apostate uh heret heretical types in history um that they could uh you know they, they could base a character on and that doesn't even necessarily mean losing you know losing their alignment or even the consideration of their god i mean a, a paladin being a paladin is a tough road to hoe you know that's a very narrow yeah. path to walk on and Definitely. you know if you're like no i'm actually not going to help the sheriff of this county chase down these people who robbed a uh, a caravan and only took foodstuffs they clearly needed it you know there, there's no big huge marketplace for a hundred leagues in any direction they probably needed it well that to a particularly strict dm might cost them their paladinhood and they might say well erroneous i'm lawful i'm good i still believe in you but clearly i don't have what it takes to to carry your your banner forward as a special servant so you know it doesn't it doesn't mean that their alignment has to get yanked around 180 degrees to to uh chaotic evil and suddenly they're getting their full charlie manson on yeah yeah so that does bring me to a question uh slightly off topic but um do you make players declare their alignment when they're creating characters uh yes um hmm. It's an intrinsic part of the character in the AD and D experience or OD and D experience. That's a little looser in OD and D. It's more of just like a general mm -hmm. personal ethos. But when I'm talking about AD and D, it's a rule, and I expect that to be hewed. Um, I can feel like the grit getting caught between my teeth when somebody tells me I want to play a chaotic neutral character because I know what's coming. <laughs> yeah. So for me, I always just tell them, play the character how you think it's going to be played, and then I assign them what their alignment is. Like, you are playing like this or that, and then so that's how I... I still use it as a function of the game, but I don't know. I find a lot of people sort of have trouble, you know, yeah, especially when you're, when you're chaotic neutral or somehow true neutral seems even worse to me. Because then they, like, you get the people who are, like, bookkeepers. It's like, well, I did a good thing last time, so now I have to do a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not... that, that That's not a sense of balance. That's schizophrenia. <laughs> yes. Um, and Rob points out, alignment is, is part of the old school game. I know... Mm -hmm. Look, the less I talk about Wizards of the Coast, the better, better it is for my blood pressure. <laughs> Um, so I will just say before anyone asks, yes, I'm aware that Wizards of the Coast is probably going to ditch alignment at some point in the near future. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but I, I do kind of consider now one thing I will say, and this is something I've thought about for a long time. Um, by and large ethos are for the rich there for people who can afford to have a philosophy and can spend time thinking about being good and lawful or good and chaotic or good and neutral or lawful and neutral, et cetera, et cetera. Your average peasant will do what is required of them. Even, even I would say uh, like a bourgeois middle class, a merchant class in like my city of Greyhawk uh, setting mm -hmm. or world of Greyhawk setting. Um, they will do what is required of them, but they're not carrying the torch and the sword for that ethos. And you could, you would call them weak neutrals with X degree of alignment, some, probably something of lawful, you know? So your average peasant, he, you know, 
he's got to labor in the field for 11 hours a day during spring and summer and 12 to 14 during fall to get those crops in. Um, plus keep his, his, his house together and hope and pray that his Lord doesn't get a bug up their ass and decide, Hey, I'm going to go invade the next country ever. So I'm going to need all the peasant levies I can gather. That's you guys out in the field. Just no, you don't even have to put down your, your rakes and hose and stuff. Cause that's the only weapons you've got. Um, so for, for the common man, alignment is a luxury that they just can't afford. They have an ethical belief. The common man is not going to, just for funsies, uh, take the aforementioned hoe that he was using on potatoes that day and go lop his infant son's head off with it just because he thinks right. it's hilarious. That That's not what I mean when I say they don't have an alignment. I mean, they by and large don't think about it. They just They try to do the rightest thing that they can under the circumstances. If... You know, the castle up on yonder hill falls and the green flag with a white dove on it is replaced by a black flag with a red fist. Well, that's just dandy. That means they're going to be taking twice as much of my crops this year. Right. And then they, they just continue on. Now, if things get too bad, maybe you have a peasant revolt. Maybe you have a peasant uprising and you find out that that neut- that 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 bland coating of neutrality falls away and yeah actually these people do want to be chaotic neutral or lawful good and and they don't like mr red fist on a black flag up there in the castle and him and his 30 bandit knights are really not a match for 1100 pissed off farmers with pitchforks and hammers and and yep. so on and etc so for the average person alignment works a lot like it does in your campaigns yang um but mm-hmm. a, ca- a character i think that 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 the ethos that they have should be something they espouse mm, okay that's interesting yeah um well i do think that uh religion in D D is certainly one of the ways that you can help them to achieve whatever their the alignment they're supposed to be playing is. Uh, so, you know, if they're going to be good and they, you know, there, there can be, let's just say, morally ambiguous or morally tricky situations that they might run into. But if they follow a certain God, you know, like, um, I don't know, there's that saying, what would Jesus do? You know, it, they can sort of think like, uh, what would Mitra do or, or whatnot? Yeah. And that could... You know, so I think uh, to trying to trying to get characters into the best fitting religions, I think might maybe that's the best word uh, of the of the options that you have available can really help them out with that role play aspect. Yes, yes, I I would agree with that. Um. You know, I, I, I feel like uh, one thing that, that um, I did want to touch on, and I, I was feeling like uh, it might be a good time to jump into that, but I don't know what your time is like, because we're, we're on about no, 90 no. minutes. we got, we got a good audience, so I don't want to... Uh, you I'm know, okay. If you're good, okay, great, great. So I enjoy talking to you, dude. You're, you're good at... Uh, oh, thank you. on the show. Um, but uh, to go to go down to the nuts and bolts and this is more one e supremacy so but if this is also the same because i know that two I, I don't know what they are and and before anyone after i here's here's me saying this starts typing i don't want to know what they are so you don't have to flood the comments with explaining it um i know that two e introduced something called specialty priests in ad and d um one of the things that i thought was a great piece of color and this is a this is a should do this is a should do, and I think you'll agree with me here, Yang. And if not, you know, I, uh, um, clerics of different religions get to do different things. You talk about well, mm-hmm. clerics yeah. clerics can't use clerics can't use swords. Well, they can if they're clerics of Heronius after a certain level, or you know, 
yeah, but, you know, my cleric can do this, this, and this. But a high-level cleric of Foltus, guess what? They get the ability to basically cast a bolt of energy, like, once per day. Like, sun-bright energy that destroys any one undead it hits. Or something to that effect. I don't have my, I don't have my world of uh, Greyhawk box set open in front of me. But when you're looking at building your priesthoods, you know, people kid. I remember, like, I never felt like um, clerics were. Uh, uh, heal bots it's like oh man i don't want to play the cleric why don't you want to play the cleric you can cast a shit ton of magic spells and you get to wear armor and if you're a human you get unlimited leveling and you fight almost as good as a fighter you get better saving throws you know there's a laundry list of reasons to play cleric yeah but i don't get to yeah. use a sword so what <laughs> And if if you have a player who's just like, I want to play cleric, but tart your clerics up. You know, yep. I, I just said um uh that that in the uh in the Jacidian religion in my campaign, there is a proper temple, but there's also witches. If a player came to me and said, Yeah, I want to play a cleric of Heronius, I've heard about how cool they are in your campaign. I'm like, I'd be like, Okay, do you want to play a or uh, not of Heronius, uh, of uh, Weejas? Okay, do you want to play a cleric cleric or do you want to play a witch? I want to play a witch. Awesome. And I grabbed Dragon Magazine 114 and we, we'd help him create a witch character. Um, mm -hmm. And that is something that is completely outside the lines as far as as far as that goes and it helps strengthen the idea that you know six clerics in a row in AD and D all with the wisdom of 15 at first level can each cast two cure light wound spells don't make it like that you're the DM mm -hmm. you are the author of the world you are effectively God <laughs> so 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 go in and look if you're even if you're not running the world of Greyhawk, the world of Greyhawk is a great wellspring of ideas. Look at it, yeah, and look at what clerics get to do at higher levels in the world of Greyhawk, and that that'll make your clerics not so generic. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. I mean, I can understand if you're playing a module out of necessity, like you just don't have time to put a lot of a lot of your own spin on a campaign um but i think that uh yeah customization is best uh you know whatever um whatever sort of god your character is going to end up worshiping you know they should eventually start to favor your character because your character is doing more things in their name bringing them more prestige so yeah let them have uh flavor uh you you want to say um well you can't have swords well okay maybe you give them sort of a a sword the the god creates a sword of light in their hands um so it's you know kind of not a sword but it is a sword or um special spells maybe uh the god is a god of the storm so you know once a day you can at a high level you can cast lightning bolts or something so there's a lot of flexibility as a dm you know make it memorable for the players uh, i normally find that you know players like gold and they like the special you know a sword plus two or or plus three or whatever but a lot of times the things that they remember are are the little flavor things that most align with their characters. Yes, I I I agree definitely. Um and you know, it, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a cleric. It can mm -hmm. it can just be a religious experience. Look, I had um uh, my buddy Jeff, I was talking about him earlier. He he was playing a magic user, Jagu, who believed in the lucky rat god. Well, there's no lucky rat god in the Greyhawk pantheon. 
right until the minute he said, my deity is the lucky rat god. Well, guess what? On that evening, the lucky rat god was born. And, you know, he, he, he would... He would make saving throws and have, you know, excellent, uh, you know, amounts of damage thrown on magic missile clouds and escape things by the skin of his teeth. And, you know, oh, thank the lucky rat god, indeed. So there's a lucky rat god. That's a, that's a player bringing something cool to the table. And poof, you know, he's an obscure deity <laughs> to be sure. But mm -hmm. it's, it's just... Uh, just let your players have as much fun with it as you're going to, because it goes back to what we were saying earlier. The, um, they, you can mine them for ideas just as well as you can come up with your own. And if they're willing, if they're willing to do the heavy lifting, let them. Just be consistent about it, though. Don't you know? Don't necessarily. Say, yeah, you guys make up all because you give players an inch and they'll take a mile. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You give players an inch, and they will absolutely take a mile. You'll wake up one day and say, "Yeah, it's Heronius's will that I get five thousand platinum pieces a month." Is it now? <laughs> and yeah. that's when they get stripped of their powers. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so let me ask you this: Let me bounce this question mm -hmm. off of you. Do you, in your campaigns, um, do you do? Uh, religious encounters do you have gods and or their servants making the occasional visit to the prime material and inter oh. and interacting with players i should say well that's funny you should mention that um so i'll say in the campaign that i'm working on now some of the gods are in the world mm -hmm. um and some of them uh there there are a few places where the gods are fairly obvious but they're, uh, they've sort of, uh, I don't know if degraded is quite the right word. They used a lot of their power to stop a force from invading the world. So there's some there, but they're not the same all-powerful gods that they were before. And some have just sort of retreated from the world. And like one's living in it by himself in a cabin in the woods, just hanging out. Right. And um, things like that. So... Yes, there are gods. Yes, players sometimes interact with them. But then there are gods who um, they're they're just hiding from the world. Um, they don't want to be known. And I have a, sort of a, a special mechanism, um, which I think you might hate, <laughs> but but we'll uh, we'll go with it. So one of the things I don't like in modern D and D is their idea of the astral plane. Okay. Um, it's they made it just like another place you go. There's nothing special about it. So in my world, uh, whenever you go to sleep, your mind goes into the astral plane. Okay. And uh, so you you have dreams and whatnot, and then you wake up and you come out, and so you forget. <clears throat> so like if you know sometimes. In the real world, like you'll have a dream and your buddy will be like, oh my gosh, I dreamed of the exact same thing. So that's your minds found each other in the astral plane. So the astral plane is one place that you can use to contact your deities. Um, and so in our world, you know, traditionally a lot of people would use, uh, like shamans would use, uh, shall we say, illicit substances. Um, so that's one way you could do it because otherwise it's like a dream. You're probably going to forget the dream. You're not going to remember what your God told you to do. So you would use these other substances to enter that same realm while you're awake. Um, now you certainly don't have to use substances like that. You could go, um, like on a fast in order to do this. You could do like a sweat lodge experience. Um, you can, you know, players can decide some kind of physical activity uh like in our world like uh sufti muslims are the ones that spin around and around and around because they they get themselves so dizzy like a record baby. start to right round round I'm exactly sorry. i apologize please continue 
Um, so, you know, you can do these kind of things in which you enter this realm and you can find your God and you can talk to your God and how much you remember, you know, depends on certain things. Or you can go to holy places. So in the ancient world, a lot of times it would be like a spring or a lake. Uh, tons of mountains were holy places. It could be somebody's burial ground. And so players will have, they'll go seeking these religious experiences. And sometimes the gods will come to them and talk to them, but in their dreams. Okay. So that's the way I'm currently doing it in this campaign. Well, no, that's fine. And there are some great real world uh, examples. And, th and I'm sure mm -hmm. you're w well aware of this is, uh, you know, the... Um, the uh aboriginal religions in australia you know alcharinga you know mm -hmm. the the, the dreamland that that that's an i mean uh many of the uh aboriginal beliefs were that it was just as re like you you lay down and you go to sleep you're not going to sleep you're waking up yeah in a new land exactly and it was just i mean they considered it to be just as real as what they did day to day um and then uh on the um on the 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 fictional side uh you know lovecraft's dreamlands if you've ever read the dream mm -hmm. quest of unknown kadath oh yeah um, yeah that's that's the same thing you know you had expert dreamers like uh um oh i forget he was the only character that lovecraft have ever had uh show up in multiples of his game and he was the protagonist of the dream quest of unknown kadath um was it carter randolph carter am i getting that right somebody will tell uh, me i chat, think so. sure i think it was something carter yeah but um but he uh you know if you wanted to get to a different physical place in the universe you could simply dream yourself into the dreamlands and find mm -hmm. a friendly uh, ghoul or or other being that might guide you, or that they might lead you into a trap and eat you. But you know, mm -hmm. for for the right amount of coercion and persuasion, they might lead you to a door where you'd come out and just oh boom, okay, well you know I was in Massachusetts and I talked to my buddy you know Bob the ghoul and he led me to the door that opens up in downtown London. Um, yeah definitely so the dreamlands and using the astral plane as dreamlands i mean i don't that doesn't make me grit my teeth man i think that's i think that's oh, awesome. i was gonna say more using illicit substances but oh you oh well you know um <laughs> but that's campaign dependent you know yeah. i make it so that there's plenty of other ways to do it without that but for the people who like it you know it's there yeah i mean <laughs> You've got the uh, the the Myconids in uh, A three or A four mm -hmm. um, in the Dungeons of the Slave Lords. The Myconids get high on mushrooms. The Myconids are mushrooms. They make the mushrooms out of themselves that they get high on. They literally get high on themselves to communicate and cast spells and and heal and other things. I always thought that was kind of hilarious. You want to do some shrooms with the shrooms? <laughs> yeah, but is it the shroom shrooms or just other shrooms? You know. <laughs> um so yeah no i i i think that's uh I, I think that's a very cool little touch there i really do i also have uh you know since it's sort of a different plane you can encounter enemies there um so i've sort of set it up so that uh you could eventually encounter sort of a freddy krueger like character who comes to find you every day when you go to sleep but I've also set it up that you could become somebody else's Freddy Krueger. That's and you're basically <laughs> you're terrorizing them in their dreams. That is that is messed up. I love it. I love it. Um, I can't find it handily, but and I wish I could. But there was I read a couple of short stories from back around the early two thousands that a very very talented. Uh, uh, short fiction author wrote i it, not you know like oh i could buy this a book of this guy's stories but um they were titled slumber punk the genre that he wrote oh. and he just kind of tongue-in-cheek wrote them and 
they're more set for if you're familiar with the delta green setting the modern call of cthulhu uh, uh-huh. conspiracy aliens kind of thing but um the author brought in the idea of of uh intelligence services in britain they had these two agents and they were expert dreamers and they like you know people that would have like you know, continual nightmares that they're burning alive and it driving them insane. Well, it turns out there's just some fucked up person who, pardon my language, some messed up person who just got off on torturing people in their dreams. Here come these two investigators. They're expert dreamers. They enter HP Lovecraft's dreamlands and find the person that's doing this and put a stop to it. And they were, it was just a group of short stories that were exceptionally well done. And I think the idea of using the astral plane for something like that, or even the ethereal plane, or hell, mm-hmm. just have a whole, just pick a set of, of planes and just say, okay, um, you know, there's a dream plane in concordant opposition. It's just where everybody's dreams congregate and you wake up and there you go. You know, you're done. Um, you've yep. dealt with the problem. So. So we have been going on for almost two hours. Um, I think uh, I think we've solved all the problems with the religion in D anD. d We don't ever have to do this. Again. Totally fixed. Right. Totally fixed. That's right. That's the beauty of this live stream, folks. I fix all th- all things D anD. d and then I bring on guests to help me out, and they do it. So we we've we've solved the problem of religion in D anD. d But no, all kidding aside, I would love to touch on this and other D and D topics again, if you're, uh, open to that. Uh, Oh yeah, definitely. Good, good. Um, well folks, please do check out, uh, Yang's story time. Let me see. Did I No, Of course I don't have the tab open. (laughs) I think it's in the description. Uh, I believe you're right. Just in case we have exceptionally lazy people uh, listening to the stream, I'm going to drop that in to the chat one more time. Go listen to Yang's page. Like it and subscribe to it, please. Give him a thumbs up. Click that bell icon. I like it when people do it for my channel. And I like it when people do it for channels of people that I also like. So please uh, go check his channel out for the rest of the discussion here. Um, tomorrow I'm going to be putting my feet up and watching some college football. So you guys aren't going to hear from me till Monday. Um, (laughs) but definitely, uh, try some of these ideas out. Um, this stream is a Watsy wisdom of the crowds. Thank you, passerby. Um, but, uh, Yang, just in closing and passing, did you know that when I hit a thousand viewers, a thousand subscriptions rather on my live streams, we're going to have a mini gaming convention, a virtual yeah. mini gaming convention. I don't oh, ex- awesome. Don't exactly have the scratch to rent out a con space, but uh, a virtual mini gaming convention. So um, tell everybody to come over and like and subscribe and click the bell icon and listen to me ramble on. And uh, if you don't like it, leave a thumbs down. If you do like it, give me a thumbs up. Um, and you're you are more than welcome to attend that con, my friend. I would love to. Whether you want to play or you want to run something. It's not just going to be me. If I get other people wanting to run games, it's not just going to be me. You guys can. All right, definitely. But the closer we get to it, the more I'll know, because we're currently sitting at 774 subs on the channel now. No, 783 subs. 783. I was thinking 773. But no, we are sitting at 773 subscribers, which you guys have made happen, both you guys in the audience and having great guests like you on Yang. So thank you very much. And remember, it's YouTube. It's not either or. Ooh, whose channel should I subscribe to, Bill or Yang's? Oh my gosh, I don't... Oh, what do I do? Don't have an anxiety attack. Like them both. Watch them both. I do. Actually, I don't watch my own videos. I can't stand my voice. But um, anyway. Yeah, I don't watch mine either, but... Yeah. I, I just kind of remember. It is very awkward when somebody comes back a year later and asks you a question about a video, and you're like, "Ooh, I don't really remember what I said." Yeah, yeah. I used to do little tiny pre-recorded videos, which is actually better mm-hmm. for the algorithm. 
but you know i do like 10 minute videos 11 minute videos things like that and they were not very edited at all i don't know how to edit although i did get some some decent editing software decent in that it has a very shallow learning curve so i'm looking forward to maybe going to to that but um uh yeah i i, I get people commenting on videos from like 2011 they're like Oh, cool. I like Keep on the Borderlands, too. Especially that part where you said this. I said that. And then <laughs> yeah, I got to go exactly. watch the video, and I don't like it because I don't like my voice and for all the mentioned reasons. But anyway. So, yeah, it can be kind of an interesting interesting time going back and eating your own cooking, so to speak. Eating your own leftovers. Exactly. So thank you all for watching. Thank you, Yang, for stopping by. Everybody, have an absolutely safe and fantastic weekend. And I will see you all Monday. We'll be back for some fun stuff. Tuesday, we're going to come back with a game recap. Uh, Kyle is, uh, once again, because of situations in Australia, he won't be co-hosting uh, with us next week. But he's in our thoughts, and we'll hope to see him again soon. And then next week, I'm not sure what day, but I believe next week we're going to have Tracy Lesh on. Tracy's awesome. Do you know, you know Tracy, Yang? Uh, I don't know Tracy. You should you should get to Tracy's a swell guy. He's a TSR vet of old, and he lives just up the street from me, which is even nicer. Wow! Yeah, that's awesome. It is. So, have a great Friday evening, guys. Peace. Thank you, Yang, for being here. I'll talk to you all later. Bye bye. Good night, everyone. <laughs>